2 Kings chapter number 4, 1 through 17. Before we get here, Elisha is not Elijah, the Tishbite. I don't know if you're in, any of you guys are like me. Sometimes you read the Bible and you get names mixed up. You're like, where did that come from? And who, where does he go? And he's who? And he's the son of what king? And what, what part of Israel? And Samaria? And Shushan? And Bethlehem? And where are all these places at? Okay? So I'm going to give you just a little background real quick. Okay? Elisha is not Elijah, the Tishbite. Elijah came first and then Elisha. Okay, let me say that again. Elijah came first, and then Elisha. All right? I know that may, and don't take, I'm not belittling that fact. I'm just saying, I understand that some people haven't gotten there yet. Okay? It's common. I understand that. All right? So Elijah came first, and then Elisha. Gehazi is not Elisha. All right? Gehazi is not Elisha. Gehazi is not the prophet of God, but the servant of Elisha. Okay, that's important to know. Gehazi is not the prophet of God here, but the servant of Elisha. Elisha requested the double portion from Elijah. Elisha requested the double portion from Elijah. All right, that's important to know. We also see that we, we're picking up here in chapters 2 and 3, okay? We're leading up here that uh, we pick up that Elisha's in Jericho. He travels to Bethel. And then he goes up to Mount Carmel. All right, you follow me? Up to Mount Carmel, and then he goes down into Samaria. All right? So he's in, Jer he's in Jericho. He travels up to Bethel, and then he comes down to Mount Carmel. And then he goes down, he goes back down into Samaria. All right? A couple things that are going on geographically. In Israel, all right? Israel, everyone knows, Israel was not always worshiping God. In the Old Testament, not all the time, not all the time was Israel worshiping God. In this situation, in this time frame, in this, this area, at this time, Israel's king is Ahab. All right? Israel's king is Ahab. Ahab dies, and his son, Jer uh, Jehoram, becomes king of Israel. Well, when King Ahab dies, it puts into place his son. Well, Ahab worshipped the images of Baal. His son, King Jehoram, tore down those images. All right? He tore down those images... But unlike his father, he still clinged to the sins of Nabat. Yeah. All right, you follow me? Yeah. So we have king of Israel, Ahab. He dies, and now we have his son in, in place. Yeah. All right, follow me? I'm trying to keep it really simple here. And then we see when King Ahab dies, King Moab rises up against Israel. This is his time. He's on, it's time to conquer. Divide and conquer, right? Yeah. And then we see here, King Jehoram, King Jehoshaphat. King Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. All right? King Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. And then we see the third one, King Edom. So we've got King Jehoram, which is now the king of Israel. King Jehoshaphat, which is the king of Judah. And we have King of Edom. And they all come together. All right? We see they traveled a seven days journey. And now they come to a place with no water. All right? They come to a place with no water. And then we see there was no water for them. And there was no water for their cattle. Okay? There's just no water. And then we see an ungodly king Jehoram gets scared. All right? We see this king, one of the three, gets scared. And then what happens? King Jehoshaphat, which has aligned with an ungodly king, he gets scared, and he decides, well, wait a minute. Let's inquire of God. Right? So the first one just gets scared because there's no water. All right? There's no water. Our cattle can't drink. And then King Jehoshaphat says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's, let's ask God to see what he says. And so he goes on, and he says, let's ask Elisha what will happen. Remember, Elisha poured water on Elijah's hands. There is no water here. Think about that. Think about what's going on. There's no water in this land. There's no water for the people. 
And now, this king, the two kings, one's wicked and one's okay, and they're aligning together, and they're going to see a man who poured water out, and they don't have any water themselves. All right? They, they come, they talk to Elijah, okay? And then they go out to battle against Moab. We see the battle rage. The Moabites are defeated. And that brings us to our text. All right? If you guys would, stand with me. I'm an active preacher. Okay? I'm an active preacher. I love the Word of God. I love reading the Word of God. But stand with me as we read here, okay, if you're able. 2 Kings chapter number 4 and verse number 1. I've brought you up to where we're at. And it says, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into those vessels. And thou shalt set aside that which is full. And she went from him, and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. She poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. But we're not going to stop there. And it, came to, and, it, and it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God. She got that right. Which passes by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be, when he cometh to us, that he shall turn in hither, thither. And it fell on a day that he came in thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he, said unto, and he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. Her own people. And he said, What is then to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily, she had no child. She had no child. And her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. And let us pray. Father, Lord, I ask you now, Father, Lord, Lord, this message is absolutely nothing from me, but it's from you. Lord, it's your word. I ask that you would allow me to speak what you would want me to share with these people. Father, I, Lord, if, if they get nothing from this message, Lord, I just want to say thank you for giving it to me. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Amen. And I am thankful for it. If nobody gets anything, I am thankful for it. I've already shared thankful, thankfulness for it. And Lord, I just say thank you again for giving me the opportunity. I thank you for Brother Foster asking me to come. I pray that you'd be with those people of St. Lucia tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would give them an opportunity to share your word. And Lord, I pray that you do something amazing there. 
Lord, I pray that you would allow this church to be a part of that because that is what it is all about. Lord, I pray that you would give us the opportunity tonight to just learn a little bit about you. May we be encouraged by you. And Lord, may we decide tonight that we want to make it a little bit more personal. Or we want, to, we want to make it a little bit more real to us tonight. And we, Lord, I'm not saying you're not real, but I pray that we would make it more real. We would, we'd get a little bit more interested. Maybe we'd get a little bit more devoted. Maybe we just decide that we just want to take it a step further. Maybe we just want to walk through that door of faith tonight. And Lord, I ask that you would just give us wisdom. Help me now, Lord. Give me the words to say. Father, I pray if there's anyone here that has never accepted you, I pray that tonight that they would. And Lord, I pray it's never, Lord, I pray that they would get saved before it is too late because right now it is not too late. And Lord, I ask you all these things in your name, Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. Amen. Thank you for standing on God's word. <clears throat> There's a couple things here tonight, and I won't, I'll try not to be, uh, I'll try to be quick for you, okay, tonight. But 2 Kings chapter 4, 1 through 4. First, we see a woman who owed a debt that she could not pay. Right. Does anyone else in here owe a debt they cannot pay? She owed a debt she could not pay. I am thankful when people realize they, go, they can't pay a debt. Okay, I am thankful when people realize they can't pay a debt. Because you know why? That means they have made the first step of getting closer to being saved. I'm thankful for that tonight. I am thankful for that. I am glad I'm saved. Okay, I am glad I'm saved. She cried out to Elisha. We see in verse 1. Verse number 1. My husband is dead. And the creditor has come to take him, take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Isn't it nice to know that God has the answer? I am glad that Jesus has the answer. She cried out to Elisha. Elisha is the man of God. Who do we seek when we're in trouble? Pastor, does everyone come to you when they're in trouble? Who do we seek when we're in trouble? A lot of times we're running, aren't we? We're running to everybody else. We're running to our, you know, our best friend from 20 years ago, our neighbor that's left us 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Who are we seeking when we get in trouble? Where does our help come from? Amen. Where does our help come from tonight? Elisha asked what he could do. Do you ask that question sometimes? I bet he asks that all the time. You go to him with the problem, and you say, Pastor, I've got a problem. And what's he say? Well, what can I do? Let's pray. Right? Th those are things that we do. It's commonplace. Sure. It's commonplace. That's what he's supposed to do. That's why you guys pay him the big bucks, right? Yeah, right. That's right. Elisha wanted to help. He was concerned. She used what she had. Yeah. Okay? She used what she had. She only had a pot of oil in the house. Right. Verse number two. She used what she had. She was instructed to go and borrow vessels abroad of all thy neighbors. This message title tonight, and I haven't shared it with you tonight, it is Borrow Not a Few. Yeah. Borrow Not a Few. Right. I don't want to limit what God's going to do. Right. St. Lucia, you got opportunity in St. Lucia. Right. Do not borrow a few to go to St. Lucia. Right. Borrow not a few and go to St. Lucia. Yeah. Just go down there and make it happen. Yeah. Go down there and make it happen. I, I remember, I can tell, share testament, I'll share with him a little bit. I've been in the Caribbean. I have preached in the Caribbean. And those people, I will testify, those people down there want to hear the Word of God. Sure. But I will also testify to what, what you were saying about the man. They go in and out. They're in and out, in and out, in and out. It's all about the, you know, a lot of people go down there, there's money and, you know, the, the paradise and all, everything else, right? Those people down there are hungry. Sure. They want to get saved. But they have got to have somebody go down there and preach to them. Yeah. They've got to have somebody preach to them down there. And somebody's got to go. Somebody has got to go. When I was in the Bahamas, I didn't tell you this. When I was in the Bahamas, I, they, I gave myself a nickname. Because if you're going to go speak to a people, you need to be of those people. You need to be of those people. I, I would be a fool to think that I can be, keep my culture and go to some cult in Africa and think that they're going to listen to me. They're going to wonder if I'm a, who knows what. I have got to understand where they're at. We are to go to the people and tell them about something that is greater than we are. All right? Borrow not a few. How many is not a few for you? How many is not a few for you? What is your number? How many pots do you want to go get tonight? How many do you want to get? Are you dreaming big tonight? I, if there's anything I have a flaw of, and my parents will tell you, and my sisters will most definitely tell you, is that I dream big. They will tell you, Aaron, you have lost your mind. I told my sister one time about a goal I had. And, you know, she looked at me and she said, you are crazy. I said, well, you know what? If you don't shoot for something, you'll miss it every time. I mean, she looked at me, and I was dead serious. And she said, you are crazy. I said, well, I'm going to do the best I can. 
Let me ask you tonight. Borrow, not a few. How many is your number? Are you dreaming bid? Proverbs chapter 3 and 28 says, Say not unto thy neighbor. Because what did they tell him? What did he tell him? Go to your neighbors. Go talk to them. Who is your neighbor? Go talk to them. Proverbs 3, 28. Say not unto thy neighbor, Go and come again, and tomorrow I will give. No, it's when thou hast it by thee. Is what the Proverbs says. Leviticus 19, 13 through 14. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shalt not abide with thee all night until the morning. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear the God, I am the Lord. Borrow not a few. Psalms 19, 9. The fear of the Lord is clean. I like that. I wish I was cleaner. I'm trying to get clean. It's a daily walk with God. Proverbs 19.9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Amen. Ephesians 4.25, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Speak his truth with his neighbor. Borrow not a few. For we are members one of another. Borrow not a few. Luke 10, 25 through 29. I love this. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, and saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Let me stop right there. If you're here tonight, and you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's not too late. If you're here tonight, and you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, it's not too late. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever. That means me, you, and anyone else in between. Okay? God loves us. God loves us. And it is never too late for someone to be saved. That's what it's all about. Okay? And glorifying God. He loves us. And listen to what this says. He said unto him, talking of Jesus, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Verse 27 says, And he answering said, This is what the lawyer says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Neighbor. Then he says, And he said unto him, This is Jesus, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt be saved. But look, it says this in 29, But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Borrow not a few. Borrow not a few. Luke 14, 12 through 14, Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. 13. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Matthew 5, 15, it says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. And this is where I think you were going a while ago. But a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Borrow not a few. Do you have any goals tonight? Ask yourself, do you have any goals? Any material goals? Family goals? Spiritual goals? I remember, in my, I'll share with you testimony real quick. In my life, when I, was in teen, when I was a teenager and when I was younger, I said to myself, Lord, if nobody... and I." If, if nobody else wants to see anybody saved, Lord, I want to see ten. I had never wanted anybody to see the Lord before. I never, God, I had not done that. But I said, I need to start. I want to start. So I just made a goal for myself. Lord, I don't know. I don't. I know I'm saved. I know I can tell someone how I got saved. But I need to. I want to see people saved. And so I just made a goal. Do you guys have a goal tonight? Does anybody have a goal? Do you have a goal for anything? Do you have a goal for St. Lucia? What is our goal? What is our spiritual goal? What is our family goal? Is it family devotions? Time alone? Prayer goal? Time and time prayer? I don't know. I have no idea. No idea. My goal tonight is not to tell you what to do. My goal tonight is to challenge you and make you think, man, what should I do? Borrow not a few. 
borrow not a few. Are you satisfied with where you are at? What if she had only gotten a few? What if she'd only gotten a few? What if she'd quit? What if she had quit? How disappointed would she have been? She had who knows what behind her. But if she had quit, I don't know. How disappointed would she have been? Who do you love? Who do you love tonight? Who do you care enough about to go after? Bus kids? The guy across the street? Childhood friend? Children? Spouse? Mother? Father? I don't know. The Bible clearly instructs us in the New Testament to love thy neighbor, right? That's a given. Will you be disappointed in heaven? Moving on. Instructed? She was instructed to gather what she will, and then she was told to shut the door behind her. She was told to shut the door behind her. 2 Kings 4, 4. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out unto all those vessels. And thou shalt set aside that which is full. Shut the door behind you. Verse 21 in chapter 4. And shut the door upon him. 21 says, And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, and she shut the door upon him and went out. I am going somewhere with this. Shut the door of sin. Open the door of faith. It is not always easy. It is not always fun. It's hardly ever easy. And it's really actually hardly ever fun. David did not offer, and he did not sacrifice without it costing him something. He had an option. He had an option. But he chose something. He chose something. 2 Samuel 24, 24. And the, and the king, which is David, said unto Aaron, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Right. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. Right. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Did you know today that the shekel is the most valued currency on the planet Earth? Wow. Did you guys know that? And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. God provides opportunities to turn from sin. God is a very long-suffering God. Amen. Cain and Abel were the first kids on the planet. Amen. Cain was given an opportunity to turn from his wrongdoing when God puts sin at the door. God provides opportunity. Sin set aside from offering just equals sin. But when you combine the sin and the offering, you have the sin offering, and then that equals a sacrifice for our sins. A sacrifice for our sins is Jesus Christ, and that gives us a ticket to heaven. God never shuts the door on someone who's interesting in coming through it. Okay. Romans 5, 20, moreover the law entered, that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. From the beginning, God gave Cain an opportunity to be forgiven. God never shuts the door on someone who's interested in coming through it. Satan is still a very real threat. We still choose sin. Sure. Okay. However, we, kill, we can still have victory. Sure. This life is but for a moment. Our life is but for a vapor. This is not an excuse. This is a reality. Okay. Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you're here tonight, God loves you. Right. He has sent his son for you. And he is giving you an opportunity. Amen. He is giving us opportunities. And even though we are sinners, and we all are, God still loves us, and he demonstrates that by giving his son to us while we were yet sinners. So tonight, you can accept Jesus as your Savior if you never have. You can do that. It is not too late. John 5, 14, Behold, Thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Just because we're saved doesn't mean we have an excuse to go sin. Right. Nor does it give us the right to go sin. Right. We, we're all held accountable for that, myself included. All right? God does demonstrate that he does still love the sinner. Cain, get up, sin lieth at the door. Yep. Genesis 4, 7. And thou, if thou doest well, talking about Cain... Thou shalt not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. 
Hebrews 11.4 By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Do we have to speak to present our message? Think about that. Do we have to speak to present our message? Do we have to speak to present our message? Think about that. Let that sink in for a minute. Do we have to speak to present our message? Does our walk speak louder than our talk? The sacrifice of Abel made it into the Bible's hall of faith. Think about this. Maybe why? Well, ask yourself why. Because he did that which he was instructed to do. He was one of the first. He was the first, one of the first children, right? Amen. There are a lot of people for us to follow. There are a lot of examples of what not to do. Abel only had his father, his heavenly father, and his uh, earthly father. Think about it. Abel was following a higher instruction. All right? It matters what you do. This young lady, or this lady, borrow not a few. Our steps always go farther than our fall. The woman poured out what she had for the Lord. Think about it. Borrow not a few. She poured out what she had. She ran out of people before she ran out of work. Think about it. She ran out of people before she ran out of work. You have got all kinds of people in St. Lucia. But you probably don't have enough people to go help reach the people that you do have. Think about that. Borrow not a few. Borrow not a few. There is not a vessel more, and then the oil stayed. What if there was more vessels? The oil would have kept pouring. Right. Now sell the oil, pay the debt, and you and your family live on the rest. She ran out of vessels before she ran out of work. We run out of people before we run out of work. Is our vision large enough? Do we see the big picture? Wow. And I'm going to speed up here, okay, for time's sake, because I am running out, and I, I, uh, I'm going to try to get to a point here real quick, but I'm going to try to finish tonight. Number two, God always has a process, doesn't he? God always has a process. Look at uh, 2 Kings chapter number 4, and we're going to pick up here at 18 real quick. And I'm going to start picking up real quick for your, for your sake. Not for my sake, for your sake, because I enjoy every minute of it, okay? Verse 18, and when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. This is the same child that she didn't believe she was going to have. Follow me. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him, he brought him to his mother. He sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, Listen to this, It shall be well. When we get interested in something, everything else just seems a lot less. I mean, we don't really care, do we? We just decide, we just decide we're going to go, okay? Then she sat on an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came to the man of God, to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, It is well with thee. Wow, listen to this. And it is well with thy husband, and it is well with the child. And she answered, listen to what she said, It is well. Was all well? I don't know. And when she came to the man of God, to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi said near to the thrust her, and the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I want a child? Did I want this? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said, in verse 29, Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again. And lay not my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them, and laid the staff upon the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him, and told him, saying, The child is not awaked. 
And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door, shut the door, and he shut the door, and he shut the door there upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he shut the door upon them. And he shut the door upon them. Don't we need a little bit more praying behind closed doors? What are we doing at home? What are we doing at home? Okay, what are we doing at home? And he went therefore and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his, upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and hands upon his hands and he stretched himself upon the child. And the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her, and, went, and when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Then she went in, fell at his feet, and bowed herself to the ground, yeah. took up her son, and went out. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. Borrow, not a few. How many vessels you got tonight? Yeah. How many vessels do you got tonight? This great woman in Shun Shunem spent time preparing. For time's sake, I won't read it all, but in verse 8, 4 8. Okay? Look at that. 4 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem. Can I tell you tonight? Elisha did a lot of walking. I mean, he traveled. I mean, the guy was everywhere, right? And then he's just exhausted. I would imagine he's exhausted. But this woman prepared a place for him. She prepared a place tonight for him. A couple things, real quick. She studied the man of God. She constrained the man of God. She talks to her husband about the man of God. She has observed his consistency. She has observed his pattern. She has requested to come to speak to Elisha. Call this Shunammite. We see in verse number 12. Call this Shunammite. She did not approach him. It is better to be brought high than to be put low. Amen? Yeah. It is better to be brought high than to be put low. She was not seeking attention. Her efforts did not go unnoticed. She has asked what is to be done for her. Does she want them to speak for her before the king or captain of the host? She says nothing regarding their question, but responds in humility in verse 13. And he said unto them, Gehazi, say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Look what she says. I dwell among my own people. She was content. She was satisfied. Verse 13. I dwell among my own people. Shouldn't we be a little bit more satisfied? I need to be a little bit more satisfied. Yeah, right. I need to be more satisfied. God, help me. Help me. Okay? Help me. What are we supposed to do now? This is what the man of God said. Pastor, you ever feel like that? What are we supposed to do now? What are we supposed to do? Ever been there when you were trying to help someone? Ever wondered what you were going to do next? People come to you with all the problems, all the cares in the world, and you wonder what you're going to do. Do you ever wonder if this is a situation you thought you'd be in? Amen. Whether it be good or bad, maybe the timing is just off, okay? God uses a man to speak to his people. He uses a man. God uses a man. Remember, Elisha is a prophet. Gehazi is a servant of Elisha. Dedication and commitment to the Word of God. Don't forget, God dots every I and crosses every T. Okay? She was instructed what to do. She was instructed what to do. She is going to have a boy, but notice her position. Notice her position in this, all right? Verse 15, and he said, call her. And when he, talking about Gehazi, had called her, she stood in the door. She is standing in the door, door of opportunity, the door of faith, the door that would change her life. There are so many opportunities for us. There are so many opportunities in St. Lucia. Is there not? And many, other, and many other fields. There are so many opportunities here in Florence. Sure. So many opportunities. Amen. So many opportunities here in Florence. Our sin, our sin offering, and grace all meet at the door. The arch door, blood above the door during the Passover. Yeah. God stands at the door and knocks. Yeah. Anyone paying attention? Yeah. Are we asleep at the door? Are we locking the door on God? Are we easily leaning and eavesdropping against the door? The do so God's locked that door against us? Going on. She laughs because her husband is old. Don't think, we're, don't think it's humorous sometimes um, when, when we are waiting on God. I have, this I have this issue. I think it's humorous. Sometimes I think it's humorous. Don't we think it's funny when we hear people talk about some of the things they're going to do for God? Don't we think it's funny when we, we hear that sometimes? We're like, St. Lucia and all those opportunities, is that real? Yeah. St. Lucia, paradise, opportunity, let's go. Good time, right? We start off laughing a lot of times. 
But you know what? It's real. How about this? Laughter is medicine. Yeah. Right? Amen. Think about that. Laughter is medicine. Okay? Laughter is medicine. The boy is born. The boy dies. The, play, the boy is placed on the bed of the man of God. This bed was made for him. This is where he lied dead. This is the bed where he came alive again. Woman pleased with Elisha, God. Boy is healed. All these things. But may I remind you here, God is over it all. Borrow not a few. Borrow not a few. John 5, 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And I'm going to speed up here a little bit more, okay? 2 Kings chapter 8. I want to show you one other thing real quick. Actually, I won't, even, I won't even go there and read it for time's sake, but 2 Kings chapter 8 and 1 through 19. You can read it later, okay? 2 Kings chapter 8 and 1 through 19. We're talking about a king. We're talking about a king, okay? Talking about a king. A king who, and, and I encourage you to read this later. 2 Kings chapter 8. A king seeks his face, talking about Elisha, desires his words. Elisha gives encouragement. Hazel is wicked, and Hazel kills the king. God heals restores, rewards those who seek Him. God heals, restores, and rewards those who seek Him. God rejects, destroys those who reject Him. The wicked always reject God. When you're soul winning, if you're, you're here tonight and you want to get saved, one, you've got to accept that you're a sinner. Secondly, you've got to accept your position. Thirdly, you've got to accept that God still loves you in your position. And then fourthly, you've got to acknowledge that you need a Savior. Okay? You've got to acknowledge that you're needed a Savior. God brings everything to light. God can use good people. He can use bad people. Satan can use good people and bad people. Amen. Right? God, God can use all, and God is over all. God brings to light everything. I'm going to give you these points, and then I'm going to be done. Next thing here is differences are different. We have two different women here. Differences are different. Okay? Differences are different. Okay, I was going to reference a couple things that lead up just to give you a quick synopsis of where I was going here. Pour out. Borrow not a few. We see these people. It starts down in Judah. And it passes up. The children of Israel were given their inheritance. The children of Judah were given too much. You follow me? And I'm going to skip through all the reference and everything. But the children of Judah were given too much. It was too much for them. So who gets part of it? The children of Simon. Right? You follow me? So the children of Simon share in this portion of Judah. Why? Because they had too much. Yeah. Borrow not a few. Think about that. Borrow not a few. Now get this. This great woman, you know where she was from? The children of Judah had too much. It's, it's, it spreads northward. Yeah. Ephraim, Manasseh. Yeah. Goes up to Issachar. Yeah. You know where Issachar is at? You know what's in Issachar? Shunem. Which is where this great woman is. Borrow not a few. Think about that. God is over it all. Okay? God is over it all. Now, I took a few moments in the beginning to explain some of those background of the text because there's so much that we can get when we focus on that, when we think about that. Because God is over it all. I mean, He really is over it all. Okay? Final point here. Seven tribes to receive their inheritance from Joshua. There's a difference being, uh, between being a participant of faith in God and just being an observer of the faith in God. There's a difference. There's a difference. There's a difference between seeing the faith of God in St. Lucia and observing the faith of God in St. Lucia. There's a difference. And then we see here there's a chain of command. It's at the end of seven years we see this woman brings her son in front of the king in chapter 8 and he says, who is this basically? And it says, this is the son of the woman who's the great woman of Shunem who is from Shunem, which is poured out from Ephraim, which is poured out from Judah, which is, a, which is from the tribes of Joseph. Yeah. Think about it. And, I'm, and I hope I'm not losing you. I'm going really quick here, but I'm trying to point out some things just to think about, okay? Think about this. We also see that Elisha heals the poisonous pottage there, and it allows them people to eat in, at the end of chapter number 4. And I'll point out lastly, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power on high to overcome sin. Borrow not a few? Are we seeking only a few vessels? Are we seeking God for our answers? Are we confused about what God's doing in our life? Are we confused? Borrow not a few. And I say this in 2 Kings 8, 11. And he settled his countenance steadfastly, 2 Kings 8, 11, talking about Elisha. 
And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. And the man of God wept. And Ahaziel said, Why weepest, my Lord? What did that lawyer say? Who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? Well, tonight, I, well, I just encourage you tonight. And I, I, Pastor, I apologize. I hope I didn't take too much of your time tonight. But I will say this. Just like Cain, just like Adam, just like us, just like the church down the street, just like our neighbor, borrow not a few. I am glad tonight. I am glad that Jesus did not hold on to what he had. He poured it all out. He poured it all out. We see a woman here with a need, a desire. We see God who always has a process. We see in an authority needing encouragement. I mentioned to you briefly, and I didn't cover them all, that differences are different. We see a chain of command, God intervening, and then we see the light. So tonight, if there's anyone here that's never accepted Christ as their Savior, it's never too late. You have an opportunity. The door is still open. The door is still open. And it will remain open. And I just want to say, I am glad I'm safe. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.